All right, we are back industry headlines inside live inside of Next Level Agents and of course recorded for the podcast, The Kevin and Fred Show. And today, I still don't have to put up with Fred Weaver. I am joined by my good friend, Todd Bookspan. Todd, how's it going, buddy? It is going so good. I've, I've wanted to be a, a guest on this podcast, this whole industry headline thing for quite a while. So thanks for having me on. I know, I know that you have, maybe we'll share that here in a minute, which is uh, we're going to be a mortgage rich uh, episode today for you really, because Todd, for those of you who don't know, Todd, Todd, number one, uh, runs a massive mortgage team and business. Also, um, Todd, do you, do you run a branch too, as well? Is that part of the responsibilities these days on the mortgage side of things? Yeah, I guess technically our team is a branch, so you could say that, but it's really my wife. She's the boss there. Well, we know we know she's the boss for sure. And then also you're founder of, and uh, what do you call yourself, CEO or just like the proud owner of Win by Noon? What, like, what's the official title there? I want to know that first. You know, my email signature is I'm the founder, but maybe I should make it something more important like CEO, but I heard rumors that CEO doesn't matter anymore. Man, well, so Win by Noon, for those of you who don't know Win by Noon, it's awesome. It is a productivity tool. Uh, not, uh, that is not to be taken lightly. It's paper. It's old school. It is paper guys. And it is, uh, it's pretty awesome. I've actually done an episode on it. You've been a guest actually on, uh, the Kevin and Fred show on the expert interview segment as well. So I won't go too far into that. Maybe we could just link to those episodes here in the notes as well, uh, for the podcast listeners, but Todd, let's jump into this week's industry headlines. The reason why we're here, we're going to talk about, uh, for the first time since April, we've got forbearances falling below the three million uh, watermark. We've got uh, big news at Keller Williams International last week, or in Austin, Gary Keller stepping back from the CEO role, and then we're going to also talk about mortgage applications uh, and kind of what that means as far as the changes year over year and what's going on in that that side of our industry. So, Todd, let's let's kick it off first, buddy. So, uh, you and I were talking about this offline. We're talking about uh, for the first time forbearances fall below 3 million, but we're talking about just, you know, where do things really fall when you look at short-term delinquencies versus long-term delinquencies? So what are you, what's your take on that headline and uh, what are you seeing out there? You know, I thought it was interesting because CoreLogic was reporting that the 30 day delinquencies were down, which is obviously good news, right? Cause they're throwing uh, forbearance and foreclosure in there. Um, but they were talking about that 90 day delinquencies were higher. And so it just seems to me like there's this separation right now between uh, between the people that are that are pulling themselves out of forbearance and then the people who can't pull themselves out of forbearance. And I think it'll be kind of interesting, you know, with the mortgage world, so I'll throw my mortgage spin on it. You know, in order to get a refinance, you've got to bring your loan current. And I have to imagine that since they made that rule, a lot of people who who threw themselves into forbearance but really didn't need to are now having to pull themselves back out in order to uh, refinance and take advantage of these low rates. So I'm, I'm guessing that could be part of it. What do you think? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's got to be a lot at play here. Um, my, m- one of my initial thoughts that I went to is like, okay, it, and I guess this isn't necessarily good, but it's like a separation between who's, who's actually okay right now after this big mess of tw- this dumpster fire of 2020 that we've seen in a lot of ways for a lot of folks, like who's actually doing okay and can kind of, you know, land on their feet, if you will, and, and are looking you know, things look positive. And for the folks that where it's like, no, it's actually, eh, it's getting a little hairy right now. That was one of my first thoughts on it is maybe this is an indication of we got some separation there. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we've definitely continued to hear that, right? That the, that the folks in the upper percentage of income earners have just been crushing it, right? Stock, their stock portfolios are up, their incomes are up. And then unfortunately those in, you know, a lot of the industries that are, you know, uh, like the hospitality industries, those that are really hurt the hardest are just uh, still suffering and continue to suffer even worse, especially with, uh, you know, lack of extra stimulus that they received them before. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was looking at uh, when we were getting ready was uh, you had pointed me in the direction of the core, lo- some of the core logic numbers and they were referencing back. So in July, granted, this is a few months ago, uh, with something like 6.6% of all mortgages were delinquent by at least 30 days, including uh, those in foreclosure. And that's a 2.8% increase overall compared to a year ago. I don't know if that's, um, my question is, we know that you, and you mentioned the forbearances are in there. That's part of that number. 
but is I wonder if we could take four. How long is it going to take before we can take forbearances out and just go, okay, who's what are the real delinquencies for lack of a better word? Like, how can we compare apples to apples 2020 versus 2019 so we know what we're really dealing with? I think that's the, you know, the billion dollar question, right, is how do we come out of this when at some point forbearance ends, right? Right now, people can put themselves into forbearance for up to 12 months. And, you know, who's, who knows where we're going to be next year? The good news, I think, will be that in, in most states, you know, people have enough equity that they can at least, you know, get rid of their house and not, you know, not have it be a foreclosure, maybe put a few bucks in their pocket. But, you know, I definitely think that's going to be the biggest, uh, you know, of interest statistic is, you know, what will happen at the end? Will they just extend them for another 12 months or will, or will they start to foreclose? I mean, that'll be uh, really interesting to see how, you know, we get out of this and what, how it really does impact the economy. I said, I totally agree with you. I just happened to be muted when I said that. So, and it's, it's not often that I agree with you, but I, I think you've got a, I think you got a really good point there, bud. Um, well, let's move on. So the other big, big news last week, I think that really caught everyone's attention was Gary Keller and uh, KW, Keller Williams Realty International. I almost said KWRI again, but KWX. So Gary Keller stepped back from the CEO role of Keller Williams Realty uh, in what Inman described as a massive leadership shuffle at KW. Uh, the company announced uh, last Wednesday it's creating a separate holding company, KWX, and giving it uh, a leadership structure and a complete makeover. So Keller Williams is... Uh, has named Carl Liebert, I think I'm saying the last name correctly, who's a retail financial services and industrial services CEO veteran. Uh, he's the new CEO of the newly formed KWX, uh, which is going to be the holding company that encompasses the, all of the Keller Williams brands. So Keller Williams Realty, Keller Williams Worldwide, Keller Williams Mortgage, Keller Covered, which is their insurance, and then Keller Offers, which is obviously their iBuyer platform. So that was that was big news and sort of uh, hit people, a lot of people by surprise anyways. You know, I love it because I feel like in next level agents that this is, you know, the, the KW folks versus the rest of the brands always uh, has some great uh, discussion. And, you know, I saw people commenting on the X in there. I saw, you know, certainly the fact that uh, Mr. Liebert is, uh, you know, someone who traditionally has worked for publicly traded companies, right? There's, for you sure. think there's some speculation there? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot. So I've had a, um, you know, listen, a lot of people accuse me of being a hater or whatever. And hey, maybe, maybe, maybe I've earned that. But at the same time, I'm also a fan of, of business and watching how people uh, shift and do things. And so, you know, do I think for sure they're going public? I'm not ready to say that. Am I, do I see this as a move towards it that would give them that option? Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt. Um, he, you know, a lot of the word on the street is like Josh team, love him or hate him. I'm not a fan. I don't, I don't think he's the right guy. I think they've made a big mistake in having Josh team in there. Um, but one thing's for clear. One thing is totally clear is he's not a publicly traded. He's not a guy you can put as CEO in front of wall street. Like that's not allowed. Um, there, there's no way he's going to be accepted, especially with a lot of the stuff going on, uh, in the background with, uh, with 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 some of the lawsuits and whatnot with that he's involved in but this guy carl he's got a background as you mentioned he's in like he he's been a ceo of major uh publicly traded companies before and he's certainly a guy that you can sort of pony around you know what's the word i'm looking for um dog and pony show to wall street if that's the direction that they go well, it's definitely a good year for IPOs, right? There's, right. you know, it seems like any IPO, whatever it is, you know, seems to take off and, and, you know, the special acquisitions, corporations that are coming around and, you know, having people uh, backdoor into being publicly traded. I don't know that, that KW would need that, but that's, that's an option as well. And, you know, in the end, it certainly seems like uh, giving out stock uh, for to agents and other organizations is working in their benefit. So maybe that's going to be a future retention strategy and recruiting strategy for them. You know, I, I got to believe it is. I mean, sort of my thought on this is if it's not like, OK, if if the part of the thought is to go public and it's again, that's a wild card at this point. Uh, I think you, you've you got to include it for the agents. Otherwise, man, it's re you're kind of zillowing them like you're going to zillow them if you don't. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, that's I mean, that's doing what I like that. Attitude. What, what they've always you know, you've been zillowed. Sorry. 
Like if they don't go that route, but if they go public, but they don't open that up to the associates to earn that, then yeah, like that's, that's not really a win for the agents. That, that's, that's being done to them, not for them. And so it'd be interesting to see again, who knows if they'll actually go public. Um, they've certainly positioned themselves. They could, they probably have a massive IPO. Um, like probably, you know, some people would do handsomely well if they if they filed an IPO, but who knows? All right. Well, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, down below. If you think they're going to go uh, public or not in the next uh, 12 months. Yeah, that'd be interesting. All right. So moving on to our final thing. And again, this is, this is right back to your sweet spot because mortgages, right? Let's talk about applications for a second. So mortgage applications are up for sure. I want to say 4.6%, but what is leading that, uh, probably not that big of a surprise to people is we've got an 8% re- increases in refinances, which is, if you just look at the refinance volume, that's that's up 50% year over year. So that's a big one. And then you've got purchases down a little bit, still up over last year, 21% year over year, um, but not quite leading the way when you look at the overall mortgage applications. Like what's going on in that world as far as what you're seeing day in and day out? Yeah, you know, there's a last minute push. You guys, I know I talked about it before that, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that uh, they, they're they instituting a 50 basis point, let's just call it a tax or a fee on refinances that's that's going into effect for loans purchased after December 1st, meaning that a lender has to close the loan, get it packaged and sold to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac prior to that date, or it's going to cost them half a point in fee on all those loans. And so you're already seeing that on longer locks now, lenders have instituted that fee. And so there was a last minute push over the last, you know, 30 days to really push uh, clients into applying, getting those loans locked so that they can get closed and sold off in plenty of time to avoid that new fee. So I think there's definitely been a push there. I mean, remates, rates have remained, of course, low. The Fed's still coming in and buying about $3 billion a day of mortgage-backed securities to artificially keep rates low. Because normally, right, we see the stock market going up like it's been going up most days, and that normally hurts mortgage bonds and rates should be higher. So, uh, so I think that part's pretty interesting, and I certainly wish that um, – that application volume was a little bit higher. That's a little disappointing that it's going down. What are your thoughts on that? First of all, I should say, can we just talk about that? The fed is buying $3 billion a day. Like if that's not the definition of printing money, like I'm not real sure what is, or, I mean, I'm sorry, quantitative easing. Um, That's gosh, that's still, every time I hear a stat around how much is being bought and being propped up by the fed, it's still, it's always a little bit of a, Ooh, man. That that's crazy. So, yeah, you know, with the it'd be nice to see the purchase applications up, but it'd also be nice to see some inventory. You know, like most most people, most markets just don't have a lot of inventory to sell. So, people are just, I guess, sort of refinancing instead of trying to buy a new home. I I mean, what I'm not real sure what what to make of it at this point. It's so crazy with the low and tight volume. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to see higher higher purchase applications up, but it's just not. Yeah, I think that's a that buyer fatigue, right? People get super frustrated after they've written their, you know, 17th offer and they were one of, you know, 20 offers or, you know, even if it's only four or five offers and they're just getting, you know, outbid and outbid and outbid. Uh, that I think gets disappointing and, and people hear that from their friends and maybe think, all right, I'll sign that lease again or yeah, refinance and stay and see what happens after this. Yeah, I almost wonder too if it's like I, I hate to say this because I'm I've just never been a believer in seasonality. I, seasonality exists. Obviously, you and I are you're both you're based here in Phoenix as well, um, and so we have a lot less seasonality than say Minneapolis, Minnesota, right? So it's not like we deal with crazy seasonality, you know, ups and downs. But there's a little bit, um, and I always just wonder too when you factor in the buyer fatigue of always competing against five, 10 different offers. And then you, okay, listen, let's face it. We're a couple of weeks out from Halloween, which means then we're just a few more weeks out from, from Thanksgiving, which means we're just a few more weeks out from Christmas and Hanukkah and the new year. And I wonder just how many of the fatigued buyers who maybe don't know they're fatigued yet are about to go, you know what? I'm just done. Let's give this a shot again in the new year, <laughs> which, you know, by the way, then there'll be more competition, but we'll talk about that at a, on a later episode. I'm, I'm curious about what that kind of what that looks like here, especially the election coming up and just all sorts of stuff here in the season. Oh yeah. We got some definite turbulence, I think over the next, you know, 30 days here, it's going to be uh, definitely fun to watch and, you know, hear everyone uh, shouting, 
you know, from the rooftop for, you know, their beliefs and what they think will happen. And I think you're right in the end, uh, seasonality could be part of it. You know, you definitely have the people who were nervous about COVID, um, realized it wasn't that bad to have. So now they're moving and moving up, right? They wanted a bigger place. And I think it'll also just be interesting to see then, you know, when does the rest of the workforce, we still have a huge, you know, unemployed, underemployed group. And those numbers are all reported lower than they actually are because there's uh, a lot of the folks like, you know, the gig, the gig economy, the Uber and Lyft drivers of the world who, you know, are receiving assistance but aren't actually counted in the unemployment numbers. And, you know, that could that definitely could impact it here, you know, over the next six months until those folks, you know, get get some uh, money in the bank and get back on their feet. Yeah. No doubt. All right, guys. Well, that, uh, you know, hold on, Todd. Is there anything at all that we missed, by the way, before we wrap up today? Is there anything you want to you want to add on, whether it's about more mortgage or on the mortgage side of things or just in general kind of thoughts on, on the industry, what's going on? No, I just think the thoughts are, you know, think about your consumers. I know, you know, Next Level Agents, you guys are such a great group and the people who listen to the Kevin and Fred podcast. But, you know, in the end, I continue to uh, believe that, you know, the consumer, our clients matter. And, you know, I continue to see reports that, you know, we all think we're doing a great job, but the consumer doesn't. And so just think about that when, you know, if you're a lender, you know, latest statistic was 44% of people uh, wish that they would use a different lender when they got a home. And so just think about that statistic. And I'm sure that there's possibly similar statistics in the real estate world. So um, I think that you guys are all doing a, a really, really good job and just look at it and say, hey, can you provide a slightly better experience during these uncertain times for your clients? Yeah, no doubt. The, the, if there's anything I'm sure of, we can all always get better at that. No matter how good we are at it, like we can always provide. Uh, you and I were talking too. It's like, you know, as a as someone in the business, whether it's on the real estate side of thing or the mortgage side of things, like you almost got to go through it every couple of years to be reminded of like all of the different things that are happening when whether you're buying or selling a home or you know going through the mortgage process, maybe on a refinance or whatever. Like there's a lot of things and. Um, there's a lot of places where times can feel uncertain, even when we're doing a great job and we've got to, we've got to continue to, to up our game, especially if we're going to fend off the competition we have with companies like a Zillow and open door, et cetera. Um, you know, as that process gets easier and, and better and streamlined, more streamlined for the consumer, we've got to do the same. I love it. Well, Hey, I was uh, super excited to finally get to come in and play Fred. It was a, uh, you know, a dream come true. I should have put some glasses on and, you know, but I tried to sound smart. Hopefully I did. And, uh, you know, wore my headset so I'd look like you. Love it, man. Well, Hey dude, I, I appreciate it. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, Todd and I are really good friends. Uh, actually we did a bonus episode, uh, for another, actually for a Facebook group that Todd is a part of, or, uh, helps run with his buddy, uh, Dave Savage, uh, founder of mortgage coach. So we did, did a mastermind, and which I turned into a bonus episode of the podcast this weekend. So check that out. Uh, myself, Todd and Dave Savage did that. And uh, you can also look up Todd's other episode here where I got to put it more in, put him on the hot seat next, just kind of grill him and ask him questions about his business and, uh, and his life and all the ups and downs of, of his business world. So, all right, guys, we're going to sign off for the week. Todd Bookspan, uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. All right. Thanks. It was fun. See you later.